Welcome to The Real Python Podcast. This is episode 59. Are you interested in learning more about Django? Would you like to meet other professionals and learn how they're using Django? DjangoCon Europe 2021 is virtual this year, and you can join in from anywhere in the world. This week on the show, we have Miguel and David, two of the organizers of the conference. We discuss what makes DjangoCon Europe unique. David and Miguel talk about how they got involved and how the conference passes between different countries. They also cover the struggle of upending their plans for hosting the conference in Porto, Portugal last year, and how this year could use some extra support. Tickets are available now, and DjangoCon Europe is looking for additional sponsors. If you work for an organization that can help, get in contact with them. This episode is brought to you by DigitalOcean's app platform. All right, let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, Miguel and David. Welcome to the show. Hello. Hey. So we're here to talk about DjangoCon Europe and... I wanted to get a little idea of maybe we could start off with like what you guys both do for the organization. Maybe that would be a good way to start and maybe how you got involved with DjangoCon Europe. David, do you want to start? Yes, I, I can start. I've been a Django user since 2007. Since 2017, which was my first DjangoCon, I started to, uh, to attend these conferences, got a real kick of it. It's a real interesting conference. And eventually, from our participations, we were interested in um, maybe getting a DjangoCon in Portugal. We have wonderful weather. We are a relatively cheap country to, to travel. And in 2019, in the DjangoCon Copenhagen, we were attending a meeting about the planning of the next uh, conferences. And uh, somebody, we were already with that uh, in mind, but uh, somebody asked us, Portugal is a nice country to have uh, DjangoCon. Why don't you apply for running uh, DjangoCon? And we eventually did it. And we applied for DjangoCon 2020. And that's the start of our uh, participation in terms of, of organizing DjangoCon. By that year, I think Django Software Foundation had uh, two uh, submissions for organizing Django Cons. It was our uh, submission and uh, another one from a group in uh, Scotland, Edinburgh. And by that time, uh, all the strange situation about the Brexit, which wasn't completely closed yet, and nobody really knew what it meant by that time, um, helped us a bit. I think they have a stronger uh, application than ours. Because they they are more they were more um, known in the Django community, but uh, we ended up having the concession and started plan the DjangoCon 2020. As everybody already knows, we we had COVID making a mess out of everything. <laughs> yeah, and by the time that uh, COVID was something more real in terms of uh, Europe and uh, Portugal in particular, we were already with all the call for participation uh, active and we were already with the, pretty much all the review done and so on. And uh, so we had to, uh, to take some decisions. We actually decided to go for an online uh, event to reduce all the troubles for... Because at that time, there was also some major issues with, uh, black, with the, all that movement about Black Lives Matter in the United States. In the summer, yeah. Yes, and DjangoCon US was uh, cancelled by that time because between uh, Black Lives Matter and uh, COVID, all the COVID situation, they decided that they wouldn't have DjangoCon US uh, in 2020. And that uh, actually gave us an extra um, motivation to, to have a DjangoCon uh, Europe in 2020. And that's how we ended up, ended up doing the first uh, virtual DjangoCon Europe last year. We are uh, pretty hopeful people, mm -hmm. so we uh, always believed that we could have an in, in-person event this year. 
Zhang Sofia Foundation was amazing. They, right from the beginning, they told us that since we wouldn't have the opportunity to host Jungkocon in 2020, they will extend our submission to 2021. And uh, we were really hopeful that uh, we could have uh, an in-person uh, event. Because as, as I said in the beginning, I think Portugal is a really marvelous country to have these technological uh, conferences because uh, it's not all about work. People also want to visit a nice country. We have amazing food, amazing people, great views. Uh, so it's a really nice country for traveling uh, overall. I watched the introduction video from last year. Yeah. And it, it, it was quite the travel log kind of uh, introduction of uh, showing off Porto. And it totally made me want to <laughs> go there. <laughs> you definitely whetted my appetite for, for going there. And so I, I plan for the future <laughs> to add it to one of the countries I will visit. So thanks for that. And we are, uh, Porto is the second largest city in the country. Uh, Lisbon is the capital city, but Porto is, uh, I can say it, uh, more cozy. People here are more uh, more friendly overall. We are uh, on a hilltop, so um, it's not a really good city for uh, bicycles. <laughs> yeah. We do have uh, wonderful views of uh, Riverside and before COVID, Porto was getting a huge uh, number of uh, tourism, and we are increasing uh, very in, in that in that sense. So, Miguel, how did you get started with Django Khan? So, my first Django Khan was in 2019 in uh, Copenhagen. Okay. And uh, the second one, I was already organizing it with uh, David. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. it was quite a, a stretch for me. I loved it uh, so much. It was a, a great GenCon. Although I've not had other GenCons to compare it with, I know that that one was was really good. So I also had the idea of uh, bringing it to Portugal and that conference happening in uh, in Porto. So when David uh, applied, he also talked to me and uh, I said, why not? So we joined efforts and we, we start co-organizing the 2020 edition. Yeah. Uh, just, just to give you a, an, an idea, we didn't jump to organize a conference of this level without any background. So one of the companies that, that allowed us to, uh, to do this is a company that does live events for a living. It's a company that does events in terms of uh, real estate information. They organize, uh, before COVID, they organized the... Uh, up to four events yearly, events with uh, 500 attendees at least. So um, we were pretty sure that in terms of organizing a, a conference, uh, an in-person conference, we have all that we needed in terms of logistics to make a, a good conference. And that was the one of the first things that really drive us to, uh, to apply to uh, to the organization. And the, the other part, the content uh, organization, all, all the other stuff, for people that know Django Cons, and particularly the Django Con Europe, which is each year it, it, it goes to a different organization in a different country as comparison to uh, Django Con US, which has a non-profit organization that manage the Django Con US. In Europe, uh, every year, the conference travels to a different country, to a different, different set of uh, organizers. It's still volunteer efforts in terms of organization. So we were pretty sure that in terms of logistics, we have the needed background, have everything that we could ha hope for in terms of uh, sorting out the venue, in terms of catering and all that, that part. In terms of the conference itself. We were uh, pretty sure that we would have the necessary support from the Django community itself. And that is something that was true and is true and it will be true uh, in the future. Typically, every organizer that, all, that has already participated in the earlier DjangoCon Europe is uh, very willing to help the new organizers. So we have the a uh, huge amount of support from uh, previous organizers last year. And this year, a nice group of volunteers, different areas helping us uh, with, uh, with all the organization. 
Yeah, I think it's important to to mention this part that uh, David said in terms of uh, passing the material. Since since the teams are completely different, the team from 2015 passed their material to 2016, and so on and so on. So when that material got to us, we already have four or five years of of a backlog, and with the uh, notes on what to do, what not to do. So it's despite being different teams, there's a lot of uh, information passing through to the next volunteers. So if you are thinking of applying for next year, don't be afraid, and uh, you should definitely do it. Yes, we will. We will pass along and any any bit of information that we collected over these two years. That's for sure. That's really cool. That I, that's I think is a very interesting idea that that it's a, a bit of a traveling conference and that the people that are interested in per se hosting it in their country has to have to sort of do their own sort of call for proposal, uh, sort of offer up what they, they can organizationally for it. That's an interesting model. I haven't really heard of that before, but maybe that's, maybe that's a common thing with other European technological conferences. I, I think it, I think it has something to do with your, when you are talking about the United States, it's a single country. So you can have, uh, in terms of budgets and uh, in terms of uh, other, other things, you have a common policy. In Europe, each country has its own rules, even though there, there are some rules that are similar. For example, ticketing invoicing will be specific to each country. So having a single organization that works over all the countries in Europe, it's uh, really hard. And I think uh, that has something to do with uh, why some, some of the technological conferences in Europe uh, work this, uh, this way to some degree. I think, for example, EuroPython uh, is a, a conference uh, committee centrally, but then each country has its own... Uh, they, they actually need some help locally to organize that part, the venues, all, all the all the things that need to be uh, specific to a given country, has to do, has to be done uh, by each country, uh, by a team in the local country. Yeah, I guess if we could go kind of to a wider picture, what makes something like a Django Con? Like what now that you've you've been to a couple, or in this case, hosted one yourselves. What what makes uh, Django Con unique compared to say EuroPyCon? I think uh, the biggest factor is the community. Uh, when when you get to uh, Django Con, you um, you feel at home. People are very welcoming, very inclusive. I've I've loved Django for so long, but uh, when I started to actually interact with the Django community, it was uh, even better. Miguel, definitely, I, I completely agree. For example, one thing that I found uh, extremely interesting was the Pac-Man rule. So imagine you are uh, hanging out in a, in a break and you are talking with some other attendees. There is this Pac-Man rule where you always leave a gap in the circle so other people can join in and enter your conversation. And you get to meet a lot of uh, different people through, through that. That's cool. What are the... I think of uh, Django type of projects and places I, I hear of Django being used in the U S and it's pretty disparate. I mean, real Python is very much a Django site, <laughs> the whole back end, and, and that uh, comes from, from Dan Bader's kind of background and him wanting to keep everything in Python. But what are some of the, I guess, sort of organizations and uh, places that, that use Django uh, across Europe that you can, you can think of that are notable? We have been uh, working, for example, with uh, last year we worked with Retix, which is a Django software that uh, specific for uh, ticketing conferences. We also been using Django Pretalks, which is also Django software for um, call for participations. Okay, I think that's been used in other conferences as well. Yeah, for example, in Pipe Guides, I think they were here in episode forty four. They also use this in this uh, stack. Yeah, of uh, Pretix and uh, Pretox. So it's really some uh, projects that have, al- have already been tested. Yeah, I-, I think of like a lot of governmental things that I've seen in UK that use uh, Django and uh, some other kinds of projects like that. Yes, you, you have, uh, I think, uh, Wagtail, which is the main content management system in, in Django nowadays. I think uh, they also have else organization uh, sites, if I'm not mistaken. 
that was developed by them with the Wagtail, for example. DigitalOcean's app platform is a new platform as a service solution to build modern cloud native apps. With App Platform, you can build, deploy, and scale apps and static websites quickly and easily. Simply point to your GitHub repository and let App Platform do all the heavy lifting related to infrastructure. Get started on DigitalOcean's App Platform for free at do.co slash realpython. That's do.co slash realpython. What types of talks do you... I know you're probably just ending your call for proposal now. We're recording this a little bit in advance, but what are the types of talks that, that you expect to uh, to have this year? Basically, um, the call for participation uh, was closed by the end of March. Okay. As we speak, we are uh, finishing up the review stage. We hope to, when this episode airs, to have um, a draft schedule of the conference. Um, it should be uh, okay by then. This year we have a slight uh, dropout in terms of uh, number of submissions, but it is kind of expected because um, one thing is submit talk for a live event where you can travel, and I think that that's uh, an incentive. Another thing is to submit something for an online event, and as we all know, nowadays everything is online, and um, smaller events are competing with larger ones, and DjangoCon, for example, is competing with all the Python conferences at large, uh, so it's uh, it's it's a different uh, landscape, I think. Yeah. So uh, we ended up having uh, less submissions, but from I'm, I'm part of the program committee, and uh, from what I see, we have uh, marvelous contents. Oh, cool. Are the types of talks purely about Django? Most of the talks are related to the with Django. There is usually not that much space traditionally for uh, talks that are not uh, somehow Django related or uh, or at least related with web stack sort of speaking. So um, we tend to have uh, from time to time some talks about uh, Flask for example and other uh, alternatives to Django itself but somehow related uh, with with the universe that Django works. So you don't chase the last developers out of the building? No, no. I, I think I think it's <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's important. Uh, it's important to know the alternatives to be better at your game. We all have uh, some space. I, I don't think, uh, even though I love Django and I try to use Django for everything that I do, even s- stuff that is not that Django might not be the best tool. Uh, I ended up using it. But uh, I do believe that there are better tools for some jobs and uh, we need to know them. And uh, if they are useful, they can uh, improve our work. uh, And uh, eventually, if there are other tools that uh, develop something that uh, Django should also have, we can be inspired by them. I think in the beginning, there was that idea of the the influence between Django and uh, Ruby on Rails, for example, okay. which is uh, a bit of, uh, for, from some uh, folks that I've spoken to, it is a bit of misconception. But uh, in the end, there are some, I, I don't think that this myth comes, come from nowhere. So I think both Django and Ruby on Rails might have influenced, influenced each other in some aspects. And it's not natural that that works like that. I see that a lot. There's you know, not not only in these web frameworks and and tools that you're you're talking about, but also across the language, even the core development of Python, the developers are constantly looking at other languages and and places and you know kind of techniques and tools that could be adopted in the language. So I definitely think that that kind of open mindset is is crucial with how fast all this technology moves and especially web technology. Yeah. You got to stay on top of where everything's kind of going. I, I saw um, some, time, some time ago, I revisited the, the origins of uh, JSON, okay. the JavaScript object notation. And the author of, of that told specifically that uh, part of the syntax that we are familiar with JSON, which is uh, very similar to, to Python dictionaries. Yeah. It's not an accident. <laughs> uh, he actually inspired. He was he was inspired by Python, and uh, he, he, uh, in his in his opinion, the Python helped to make JSON uh, something more uh, more easily adopted. 
So there, there are some influences, influences but even when we are talking about different languages and different uh, programming paradigms. So one of the things I thought was interesting is that last time you had the conference kind of over a weekend, and this time you're having a lot of the conference during the week, during weekdays, and having sprints on the weekend. What was your reasoning for that? Okay, last year we decided to have uh, the first online conference and we were striving to have something that uh, allowed people, regardless of uh, being working or not. And it was uh, last year it was mainly f- compulsory free. We offered the 500 tickets. Okay. So we decided that last year the conference would have uh, one week day and one weekend day. It was uh, Friday and Saturday to allow for everybody, regardless of uh, working uh, or family engagements, to participate somehow in the conference. This year, we uh, we started out the, the year hoping to have regular conference. And uh, we announced the dates and we had uh, the venue on track, everything. And it was in uh, one of the worst time to do this kind of announcement because Portugal at the time was really bad in terms of COVID. Uh. And uh, the results were really, really bad. We, we, um, we didn't expect the negative impact of that. We were uh, a bit naive, to tell you the truth. So... In the end, we kind of stick with the, the original dates. So it was not meant... Uh, last year, we decided specifically to have a weekday and a weekend day. This year, we kind of went with the, the pre-selected dates and hope that it's not a big issue for community uh, at large. Uh, because in the end, all these talks will end up in, in YouTube uh, as it is usual. And the, the weekend... That part, we were striving. One of the things that Django Con all does really well is allowing people to, to connect and to work together in some projects and sometimes bug fixing Django itself. And for example, in uh, 2019, I went to uh, Django Con US and uh, one of Django fellows was giving a workshop on uh, how to contribute to Django. And I I went uh, to that workshop, and uh, it it is really interesting to uh, to do that kind of collaboration. What we are trying to have in this year uh, conference is allowing for people to cluster in groups of interest, having some time to collaborate in projects, as uh, it is usual to happen in a normal conference. Yeah, in terms of uh, of the weekdays, it's there's also somewhat uh, different from last year. Last year, we have one track on two days of talks. And this year we'll have three days of uh, talks and workshops. So we have two, two tracks, the main tracks with, uh, with the talks, one keynote per day. And then on the, on the, the secondary track, we'll have some uh, workshops. What will the workshops be like? What kinds of things will happen inside them? So (laughs) (laughs) that's, that's a hard question because uh, uh, a good part of the workshops are, um, our content uh, submitted by the speakers themselves. We also will have, uh, and we are working on that, so it is not uh, fully closed. We are working on having some local groups taking some of that uh, second track uh, space mm. to uh, present some content and uh, to work on whatever they, they seem interesting. For example, we are working uh, on a submission for... Actually, we tried to submit something for Django Girls. We are still waiting for the official uh, reply. But if it is not uh, Django Girls, it will be uh, workshops for women. Uh, we will have that content also. Okay. So they might be more I- instructive as opposed to uh, like a presentation per se. Like more, I don't want to call it hands-on. Yeah, exactly. It's more hands-on. But some something in that vein. <laughs> okay. Yes, it, it's normally like that. Sometimes what you have in uh, in that in the in JungleCon workshops is really that you have a small project that uh, somebody will guide you from beginning to end. For example, in Django, in Django Girls, it's uh, a usual uh, kind of work where they set up uh, the system since the beginning to, till a uh, small app to working, uh, something like that. In general, like who's the intended audience for the conference? I think every Django developer should at least attend one DjangoCon. And I'm pretty sure that they won't be able to stick with just one. 
<laughs> that makes sense. They should try the first one, and uh, then they will they will want to go to to more jungle camps. Yeah, but I, I, don't, I, don't, I think it's important to mention that although the target audience are jungle developers, it's not limited to jungle developers. Sure. Last year we had uh, uh, speakers from Brazil uh, uh, talking about the uh, design. So Python developers, web developers, web designers, everyone should uh, should at least consider attending a JamCon. This week, I want to shine a spotlight on another real Python video course. Continuing with the theme of the episode, it's about Django, and it's titled "Get Started with Django: Build a Portfolio App." The course is based on an article by Jasmine Finer, and this course is presented by previous guest Martin Broyce. By the end of the course, you'll be able to understand what Django is and why it's a great web framework. You'll understand the architecture of a Django site and how it compares with other frameworks. You'll have set up a Django project and app, and you'll have built a personal portfolio website with Django. This course jumps you in and you start to learn by example. If you remember my talk with Martin back in episode four, He's a big fan of helping you work through the errors you may find along the way. Like most of the video courses on RealPython, the course is broken into easily consumable sections. You get code examples for the techniques shown, and all the courses have transcripts, including closed captions. Check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes, or you can find it using the newly enhanced search tool on realpython.com. I think about some of the conferences I've been to in the past and some of the conversations that, you know, I've been involved in, in technology conferences and so forth. And very often what made them hard or uh, sort of a difficult starter situation, even if I were to walk into that missing piece in the, the Pac-Man group <laughs> is <laughs> maybe feeling a, a, a little left out if I wasn't creating things that were similar. In this case, you have a lot of people that are, creating, you know, actual Django sites and and other tools and, and so forth. And in some ways that I think would be really exciting to me because, you know, literally people could share what they are working on with you and you can go and sort of visit it, be it, you know, like, you know, maybe carrying a mobile device with you or whatever. Is that part of the experience is that people are able to kind of share all the different things that they're working on? Yes, we have, we have something which is lightning talks. Okay. We, which traditionally are uh, submitted during the conference itself. For example, in the first day, people start to apply for a lightning talk. It's uh, five minutes. And uh, on that, you can, there is no, the, the review is poorly uh, first in, first, uh, first come, first serve, basically. Uh, and uh, you have the opportunity to, to share with the audience some small projects that you have, or if you are uh, just trying out to uh, eventually have a bigger talk, it's also a great, uh, a great place to start uh, with a small, smaller presentation. But you can show your uh, your advancements, even even if they are relatively small ones. Mm-hmm. And uh, the applications for that are already open. Okay. So I think we can put the, the URL to the description. Oh yeah, we should include that. Okay, that sounds good. So you guys kind of both mentioned how you got involved in hosting this particular version of Django Con and, and trying to, to move it to Portugal and it kind of shifting to a, a virtual event. What are some of the, the tools that you guys are using to uh, create this virtual event? That's that's also an interesting question. Last year, we worked with uh, Loudstorm, which is a platform developed by uh, three, uh, six feet up, I think. Yeah, exactly. And uh, it went uh, really well. All the support that that the, their team gave us and the feedback that we had, it was a really good uh, platform. And we we stick with that for this year also. So this year it will be also Loudstorm. In terms of uh, tools, I, I think we mentioned mentioned earlier, we are using pre-talks for uh, call for participation. Ticketing, uh, we are using a local uh, Portuguese company that develops their system on top of Django. We try to use uh, as much Django as possible in the, all the systems, so uh, 
it was a factor in deciding uh, the ticketing system. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. Sure. And in terms of tools, I think it's that. Yeah, and then we also have um, uh, Slack. So we have a, a Slack channel. We are actually using the one from uh, last year, since we already have had more than eight 800 people there. <laughs> That's good. So, so almost a thousand people there. Uh, we decided to keep the community and reuse that one. And uh, we'll also be using uh, Gather Town during the, the conference. So people get uh, a feeling of a social conference that, that, that's missing on the virtual, on the usual virtual conference. It's similar to a, like a, a Pokemon map. So you, you have your own character and you walk around the, the conference venue. What's the name of it again? I'm sorry. Gather Town. Okay. So that's, uh, we're trying to make it as smooth as possible, a transition from the, an in-person conference to a, a virtual con- conference that sometimes miss the, that social part, which is very interesting. Yeah, that's something that I, I feel like, you know, I have that conversation with the Pi Cascades people. And after attending it and, and checking it out, they had like kind of a Friday you know, meetup kind of thing. And that was fun. We were using, I can't remember the exact software in that particular case, but it was neat to kind of connect and, and talk to, to to people on that. Um, in that case, it was like a thing where as you moved your little icon on the screen closer <laughs> to other people, the conversations would get louder and, you, you know, it was, it felt a little bit like being in a hall. Yeah. Um, so I'm guessing this is something similar in that way. That's nice. No, last, last year we didn't have uh, that kind of, um, of platform, but uh, uh, Slack works out uh, pretty well. Uh, I've never seen so much people engaging <laughs> during the the talks. And uh, for example, the um, after a speaker uh, finished their their talk, uh, loads of people clapping uh, virtually in Slack. Uh, it was <laughs> nice. uh, it was really interesting. And uh, as some of the um, this year, it will be the same. But uh, we ask most of our speakers to to do a pre-record of the talk just just to make sure that uh, we will end up end up with something to stream so some of, most of the speakers actually went with pre-recorded version instead of doing a live one and uh, it was really interesting because they were engaging the audience during their own talk <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> which is nice yeah so is there space after the talks where people could be asking questions inside that Slack of, of the presenter and so forth? Yes, in the in the end of the talks, you, you, we have a Q and A with the GT, where the presenter and any anybody that wants to to ask questions can chat. Nice. And I think it's uh, we have fifteen minutes for that between each talk. Yeah, yeah. And even if people don't want to don't want to show their face. Maybe they they don't feel comfortable. They can also send a, a message question, and someone will read out loud to the to the speaker. Oh, okay. Yeah. And in the end, we post edit all this, and uh, you will uh, if uh, anybody checks out um, a talk from last year, you will see the the talk itself, and uh, in the end, you will see the Q and A stitched together with the talk. Oh, that's nice. So, so for if you're from a um, underrepresented minority. We offer the the tickets. Yes, we have uh, some sponsors specifically for uh, for those grants. So um, if you do want to to, um, to attend DjangoCon, but for some reason uh, your budget does not allow, or you don't have an employer that uh, will pay out your ticket, please apply for a grant because uh, you most probably will have the grant uh, and uh, will be able to participate in this conference. Yeah. Okay, so somebody's like on the fence and wondering if they can actually afford to go. That might be a really good opportunity for them to take advantage of. Yeah, exactly. We don't want to leave anyone out of the conference due to monetary reasons. I mean, of course, if you if you have the capability to to buy the ticket, you should buy the ticket. But if if you are excluded and you don't have the the same um, uh, economical power to to attend the conference. You should definitely apply for a grants because it's a virtual conference. So even even if you are in another country, it's uh it's much easier to attend because it's a everything is virtual. Yeah, there is not uh, visa restrictions. There is no traveling 
restrictions. So everyone can, uh, can really attend Gen Con. And, and I think we should also uh, give a word explaining why last year we uh, offered right from the top from the top 500 tickets and this year we are not doing that yeah the the reason is really simple because uh, we have a great number of of contracts already signed up and uh, last year we were able to postpone them for 2021 and here we are in in 2021 and this time we don't have 2022 to po- to postpone those contracts so we ended up with uh, some down payments from for venues and uh, other stuff that uh, unfortunately we were not able to recover so yeah this year we have uh, some expenses that we need to actually cover and as miguel was saying anybody that can help uh, we thank the the help anybody that cannot please come that because we do have some funds to uh, to allow these grants and we are we are still trying to get more sponsors to allow for uh, for more people. Yeah, and I'd like to leave a, a special thank you message to to the sponsors that uh, stayed with us. So they they could have uh, left us. Oh, since you're not having the the physical conference, I lo- no longer wish to to sponsor you. But no, uh, everyone decided to to stick with us, and we are very very thankful for that. Yeah, normally they would have um, like maybe a booth or some other kind of yeah. uh, setup in in the hall. Yeah. Um, are there other things that that the sponsors can partake in 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 the virtual sense? Yeah, we have to adapt our sponsorship offer opportunity, sponsorship offer. So we will not have a physical booth, but we will have a virtual booth inside the gather town. So people can still go to the sponsored booth with their logo and everything. It looks really, really cute. And then they also have, according to the sponsorship level, of course, their dedicated Slack channel. Okay. Where they can just uh, talk with attendees, giveaway offers. Last year, we had one of the sponsors that was doing some um, extra workshops, showing their platform, how it works. Yes, we will also, um, in the second track, which is a workshop-oriented uh, track, we will also allow for uh, some sponsors to have their content there. Traditionally, um, DjangoCon do not allow for uh, sponsored content. All the content is peer-reviewed, and sponsors uh, do not have a main stage in terms of, of uh, general talks. But we felt that this year, given the, um, the change in scenario and given that uh, some of these uh, sponsors were already sponsors for uh, last year and uh, were expecting to have a live event, we we really needed to um, to give them some something back. So we are allowing them to have content in the workshop track. Yeah, but if you are an attendee, uh, this, this type of material will be clearly marked as sponsored material. Yeah. Uh, but don't expect also to be, uh, oh, it's just going to be a, a boring demo of their product and trying to sell stuff. Because we also warn the sponsors not to do that because no one really wants to see 30-minute advertisements. So we told them to create something educational, something interesting, and uh, really make use of their time to captivate people and to to get people to to reach them. Yes, and the, you should at least check out the um, the title and the abstract of the the workshop to sh- to to see if I, I think most most of this content is interesting, uh, regardless or of the origin of being a sponsor. Yeah, yeah, cool. I was going to ask you a little bit about um, your background with Django specifically. <laughs> I'm the the older one in terms of in 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 Asia and also in terms of Django. Okay. I started using Django as I said in the beginning in 2007. By that time I think Django was in the, the version 0.96 I think. And actually one of my older projects evolved since that version till at, at this time it is still in uh, the version 2.2 the last uh, long term support version but i i evolved from 0.96 uh, throughout all the major versions and it's it's a project that has now 13 years at times it was a bit harder to uh, to evolve because django was evolving so fast 
Yeah. But since the long-term support versions, it, it has been really easy to evolve from long-term to long-term because uh, it's a real mature software nowadays. So it's really easy to evolve without uh, too much work. And uh, some of so I, I still have some pieces of code that are over 10 years and they are still working now. So um, it's uh, a stable piece of software. That's nice. What kind of project is it? It's uh, basically, uh, it was a software for a um, statistic company and it, uh, it was basically their um, server side uh, of the statistic data. The project started as a, um, a server client system. The server w- would have all the data and the client side, which at the time was developed w- with the uh, KT. So we have Django in the back end and in the front end, you, uh, we would have QT, which is a graphical uh, library. Yeah, okay. Uh, the transmission of data was serialized through Pickle. <laughs> at that time, it was before REST uh, was even uh, such a standard thing. And over the years, we evolved to, to REST, and uh, now it's full, full web, uh, taking advantage of, of the full capabilities of Django. But at that time, it was what, uh, what I was uh, taking the most advantage of uh, Django was the ORM oh, okay. and the views. And uh, I pretty much didn't have uh, any... HTML at the, at that time I was using Django as a server uniquely to uh, to uh, to send out data and, and that's the, the older project uh, meanwhile we have developed lots lots of other pieces of software and uh, use all the potentials of of uh, Django oh cool and Miguel so I started the Django around uh, three years ago I already had some uh, Python experience maybe I'd like to highlight one of the the projects that I think it was the the one with more reach that I did in Django was the DjangoCon Europe website for 2020. Okay, because we were talking about the websites, and David and I were discussing that it doesn't make any sense to to go to a a web web framework conference and use another framework to to build the websites. <laughs> it's all in PHP. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, it it was even simpler than that because some some of the previous uh, previous organizers from both DjangoCon Europe and DjangoCon U, uh, US uh, used the uh, Yugo and Jekyll those uh, yeah. static, uh, static side generators. S- static yeah, oh, okay. Side. Because it's it's really easy to maintain data and they are very performant. But I I I personally didn't like the idea of having a DjangoCon site made in anything other than Django. But at the same time, <laughs> right. I really liked the, the idea of uh, people that wanted to uh, submit content or, uh, or correct content in the site. They could just do a, a pull request in, in, in GitHub. Oh, there you go. So we ended up uh, making our own static site generator using Django. It's a uh, a really simple approach. It's not something that we can easily export, but we ended up doing that for DjangoCon uh, 2020, and we are still using it. Nice. It has like 50 lines of code, so it's it's really really basic. But it allows people for uh, to uh, to do a pull request in GitHub, and we can then with uh, content integration uh, and or we can uh, can, can have it live uh, right uh, right uh, after the pull request being accepted. That's great. So I have a, a couple of weekly questions that I ask everybody. And the first one is, what's something that you're excited about in the, the world of Python? I mean, obviously you're excited about <laughs> your Python coming up. And we've talked about that a lot, but um, maybe there's something else. Uh, this time I'll start with Miguel. What, what's something that you're excited about? I'm particularly excited about the, um, it's not Django related. I, I should start with that. With the future developments in, uh, in deep learning. Oh, okay. Because I'm studying uh, c- computer vision and image processing, and I'm uh, I'm really interested in, in in that field. So, are there particular packages uh, that you're 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 studying and checking out? Yeah, I'm particularly TensorFlow and uh, Keras. Okay, those are the the main ones, but also PyTorch. But basically, that's the my main uh, main thing right now. Okay, cool. And David, what's something that you're excited about in the world of Python right now? 
Yes, what, what I'm excited about the world of Python is is not uh, directly related with uh, something uh, specific in Python, is more the, um, the opportunity that, that I will have to teach uh, programming to my children. Because uh, nowadays you have lots of small devices, small, ro- uh, small robots and so on, and most of them have uh, Python as a programming language. So I'm really excited. My younger son is still five, so it's a bit earlier. But uh, I'm, I'm hoping to teach him programming through those tools. And uh, I think Python is the tool for doing that. Is there a particular kit you have in mind? I really like one named Cosmo, but I think uh, they are not selling it anymore, mm. which was a small robot that uh, the facial recognition and was able to, um, to check out the, the space and navigate and so on uh, with a really, real simple uh, interface. But uh, unfortunately, uh, I think they are not selling that anymore, but there are always uh, something new <laughs> yeah. with Python. I'm, I'm just hoping that uh, by the time that he can uh, play with this, uh, I have a good enough tool for teaching him Python. Nice. And uh, Miguel, what's uh, something that you want to learn next? It's not Python related to this one, uh, but I'm uh, interested in learning a little bit more about uh, CUDA and uh, parallel computing. Mm. I think there's a big field that's uh, yet to improve, but because now getting more philosophical in terms of performance, we get uh, computers that are 20, 30, 100 times faster than uh, 20 years ago. Yeah. But a website still takes uh, 20 seconds to, to load. And uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so we, I think there's a lot of, uh, a lot of room for improvement in all areas regarding to, to computing. Yeah, it's really intriguing. Like I had this long conversation about uh, video games and how, you know, as much as the development in say, you know, like a tool like Python to do video games and he was looking at moving into like these engines and these other kinds of tools, partly because he just didn't want to be that kind of like tool maker, but it's just intriguing to me that that the overall development that everybody goes through and I was thinking about this as we've been talking about Django this whole time is that it's such a different web development in general is like its own unique thing. You know, it's like, you can't really compare it to all these other forms of development. There's like each one of them has this niche of like specific (laughs) skills that you need to be familiar with and aware with. Yeah. And, and it's like, okay, well, where does the new levels of performance come from? <laughs> and I think that's that's a big part of it and trying to figure out, you know, okay, well, how do I optimize things? Like you, you talked about static, you know, site generation and things like that. And like trying to figure out like, how do we make all these things kind of, I guess that's part of why we talked about it being, you know, there's always <laughs> things moving and moving fast and, and having to kind of keep up with it. Hence the point of really having conferences, I, I think in general, but, I'm, I mean, there's always, I always feel like there's always going to be something new for me to talk about with, with people and and keep learning. And that's, you know, partly why I asked the question (laughs) too. So is there a particular hardware that you're looking at? Yeah. Currently I've been using this, uh, the the latest um, NVIDIA graphics card, the RTX 3090. Okay. Together with the i9 Intel processor, which is, uh, extremely powerful yeah yeah sounds like it and uh, has been giving me great results uh, those are built for the all the ray tracing and all that kind of fancy yeah, yeah, exactly. stuff there do you do you play games some too uh, I, I really don't play games i use it more for for boring stuff <laughs> no no it makes sense uh, <laughs> yeah, it'll so, speed but, all that up too <laughs> yeah exactly but some people already told me that i should mind bitcoin with it yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, what are you looking at learning uh, yourself? Yes, I'm. Um, I want to do. Um, it's it's not a new topic, and uh, Django three three point two is bringing it up uh, in a more uh, profound way, which is uh, web sockets. Even though I, in the past, I developed a bit of uh, JavaScript software, I really don't like this uh, division between front end and back end. Uh, it's uh, clubbersome. Mm. Uh, you end up uh, spending too much resources, uh, and I, I really wanted to uh, to go back to the basis. And 
having uh, Django serving everything. And I think uh, with WebSockets and the uh, little pieces of um, JavaScript, we can have, have uh, the control back to the backends in a really interesting way and a very performant one. So I really want to check that uh, concept a bit better. It's it's uh, something that I think it will. Uh, it's one way to go. I'm not. I'm not sure it is. It will be the correct one. But uh, I wanted to check out uh, what what I can do with that. Are there any particular resources you can point to that would help people think about this? I, I actually um, the the inspiration is uh, not my own. I actually uh, saw uh, an article a while ago. And that's the beginning of the of the idea, and I was intrigued by that. Uh, it's something from last month, I think. Okay, I can. Uh, I maybe we can share the link then. Yeah, that'd be great. It was uh, it was a guy talking about is is a Ruby on Rails uh, fan, so there there is a bit of um, he's a bit biased by Ruby on Rails, but uh, <laughs> sure. what what he tells about the having the backend uh, technology serving uh, front end through sockets and uh, lightening the JavaScript requirements, it's uh, something that uh, resonates in my mind. There is also uh, some other thing that I think it will evolve in in the years to come, which is uh, WebAssembly, yeah. which will allow us to have Python directly in the browser. It's something that I also really le- uh, like to learn a bit more. But time is uh, is a scarce uh, commodity. <laughs> <so>. Sure. <laughs> that w- WebAssembly, or uh, WASM, as like some people like to call it, has, has come up um, several times on the show. I know that Brett Cannon, who's a core developer, is really looking at He's literally unraveling Python to figure out what the core elements are so you can figure out maybe how to start building stuff inside of there. So I'm very excited by that. And then um, imagine this world you have a backend uh, developed by Python yeah. with uh, sockets, communication, web sockets, and uh, a lighter Python front end yeah. with, in to- on top of Wasm. And uh, I think that's a marvelous world to imagine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, being able to program in any of those uh, layers would be really kind of nice. <laughs> be able to kind of uh, be able to see all the, across all of them. Yeah, cool. Well, I really want to thank you guys for coming on the show and, and sharing everything with me. Thank you so much for the invite. Yes, thank you for the invite. It's, uh, it's really interesting to, to speak out some of this uh, stuff. Yeah, and for people listening, we are still selling tickets. So if you are interested in Django Card Europe, you can still grab your tickets. All right, thanks. And don't forget, you can get started on DigitalOcean's app platform for free at do.co slash realpython. That's do.co slash realpython. I want to thank Miguel and David for coming on the show again this week. And I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python podcast. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. Make sure that you click that follow button in your podcast player. And if you see a subscribe button somewhere, remember that the Real Python podcast is free. If you like the show, please leave us a review. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon.